I'm here to introduce Dan and Kevin. Um, Dan Royals is a um, PhD candidate at Temple, uh, CHR dissertation fellow this year. Uh, he has held presidential fellowship and um, Center for Humanities fellowships at Temple. He's taught modern America and Cold War America at Temple and African American history in the prison education program at the College of New Jersey, which must have been an interesting experience. It was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So his dissertation, for which this is chapter two, is Owning AIDS, the political culture of African American AIDS activism. Um, our comment is by Kevin Boyle, um, eminent professor of modern American history in our department, and um, <laughs> PhD way back when in 1990. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, taught for many years at UMass Amherst, and um, is the author of a number of books, uh, Art of Justice, um, before, um, UAW, the Haiti of American Liberalism, um, and is now working on, among other things, books on Sacco and Vincent and America in the 1960s. So I hand it over to you guys and launch yourself in a, in a comment, and there's a contextualization of okay. the, the, the comment. Um, so, as John said, this is the second chapter of my dissertation, which is on African American AIDS activism. And I came to the project not having a specific background in history of race in America or African American history, um, but doing my dissertation field in US gender sexuality in the body. And I had this idea that maybe I would do a dissertation on AIDS activism because, you know, when you're trying to define what your contribution to a field is going to be, it's just easy to find an empty field and go there. Um, and not a lot has been written on AIDS, obviously it's very recent. So um, there's kind of an opportunity to set, set, set where the field is going to go. Um, there has been a lot of critical scholarship on AIDS and the politics of AIDS in fields like anthropology and sociology. Um, and, that, and that's all great, but you know, not a lot has been written from a historical perspective, and that's important. So. Looking at the, the interdisciplinary scholarship that's out there, one thing that's very, this huge silence is that many, many people have written about the disproportionate uh, impact of HIV and AIDS on people of color in the United States. We've known that for a long time. Um, what no one has really addressed, mostly, um, there's maybe one or two books, is what people of color have done in response to that. And there have been a lot of um, kind of political and grassroots responses. Um, the thing is that they happen kind of more at the local level than in any kind of big, you know, overarching um, body. So it's been so far invisible in most of the scholarship. And so I think the biggest thing that I'm trying to do with the dissertation is just to basically established that it happened, and there was a response, and here are some ways um, that we can look at it, or some themes that we can pull out um, of what people did. So this is chapter two. Um, it's one of five, and this is the one that's, that deals most directly with responses from black gay men. Um, the first chapter is one that explores um, a division, and I look at the Philadelphia AIDS community. Um, division there, um, with the black AIDS service organization splitting off from the like mainstream gay white organization. Um, there's the third chapter, um, involves clinical trials and a drug from Kenya and the Nation of Islam. Um, that's a story um, <laughs> that is interesting that I won't uh, explain in very much detail right now. Um, and then the fourth chapter is about the uh, black church, and the fifth chapter is about the Philadelphia chapter back up in the late 90s, um, pushing for kind of more global relief, and that ends in Bush two announcing that part of this big funding package for uh, Africa and the developing world. Um, so is that enough context? <laughs> um, I think I'll just stop there. Okay. Um, well, I just. Uh, I have to admit right off the bat, I'm going to be way more formal than that, because I actually wrote down what I was going to say. Um, no, that, that's much better. I didn't, I, I, that might have sounded. So let me just start off um, by 
thank you, John, for inviting me to do the comment today, and Dan um, for putting up with my comments today. Because a good portion of you in this room um, don't even really know. And, but those of you who do know what I do know that I'm very far away from the work that Dan is doing. So um, my comments may be of absolutely no use whatsoever. And having now established my authority, let me just say uh, just a couple of more things. Um, Dan says in the opening to really that introductory piece we put on the top that the dissertation's goal is to explore African American AIDS activism. And what I read that in terms of its positioning is that that places it within this kind of massive burgeoning literature on gay history. Um, and just by coincidence, I was up in the library about an hour ago getting ready for a lecture I need to be writing for my class, um, looking at this massive literature. Um, and then positioning inside that a much smaller literature, but I think a really fascinating one, trying to extend social movement history beyond that kind of iconic late 60s, early 70s period. So that's kind of how I read your chapter and kind of the <coughs> intersection of those two things. Your specific role, you said, is to show how black AIDS activists placed the AIDS plague within a broader social and political context, and how AIDS had reshaped African American sense of their place within the African diaspora. And what section I read really didn't touch on the latter, so I'd love to hear more about that. So it's much more on the former. And what you do in the chapter is using as an entry point one aid service organization, Gay Men of African Descent, which was active, I think, but I'm not absolutely sure of this, so tell me if I'm wrong, from the late 70s through the 1990s. Uh, 86, and then they're still around today, but they don't do much on AIDS. Okay, so it kind of runs out once the larger... I'm not sure why it runs out. Um, I mean, I'm working for my archival sources that go to 97. Okay. Um, so, so they're still active in 97. They're still active in 97, and I don't know when the, the yeah. AIDS piece goes away. Um, so all I really want to do is I just want to raise a couple of questions that really came out of the chapter for me. Um, and the first centers on um, the gay men of African descent, their approach to the crisis. You say in the chapter, is it doing that? Is that how they? Yeah. Okay. Their leaders saw the epidemic among Blake, among black gay men, as symptomatic of the unique constellation of oppression facing a population marginalized by both racism and homophobia. And that its central goal in their HIV prevention work was that black gay men suffered from low self-esteem due to these intersecting forces, which in turn led them to risky sex or drug use. And it seemed to me that the organization would be an ideal example, really, of dealing with that broader linkage between broader social and economic forces and the structures of oppression and exclusion that cut across lines of race and class. Here's the tricky part for me. That it seemed that, in a lot of ways, it didn't really tackle that complexity. Instead, what I read this organization is doing is borrowing very heavily from 1970s style consciousness raising. The organization wrote essays and sponsored symposia that stressed the important contribution of well-known gay African Americans, such as James Baldwin and Baird Rustin. They published volumes of prose and poetry. They held workshops that sought to promote and eroticize safe sex. And in the most, the most detailed example you give us, they created a 30-minute educational film that ends with the exhortation that gay black men need to help each other stay strong, which is, of course, a very noble sentiment but it's also very, very inward looking. It's an attempt to build group cohesion and pride, and it isn't particularly a direct assault in many ways on that complex of forces that marginalized and in the age of AIDS threatened gay black men. And the second problem for the group, not for the chapter, faces kind of feeds from that first question. Just how effective were the programs that the organization provided? It's the simple question of numbers, which is how many people attended the workshop, how many books did they sell, that's a tricky one of course. How widely was the video circulated? I think the question, I really mean the question a bit deeper than that. I'd love to hear you tell us more about the nature of African American gay communities. And I assume that's somewhere else in the dissertation. But what I really found myself struggling with is I didn't know much about what those communities were. 
or gay communities scattered across black America? Were they urban? Were they rural? Were they all of those things? To what degree were um, gay black men in the closet with the level of homophobia in black communities? How was what the class distribution of those communities? Because that seems to be really fundamental in understanding how effective this organization was. Because an awful lot of what I saw them doing was very bound by certain assumptions of class and culture and behavior. And you can't help but wonder whether that matched the communities they were trying to reach. And I guess that last point, then I'll stop, leads me back to really the most troubling part of the story you're telling, which is you open the chapter by saying how extensive AIDS remains in gay black communities, far more extensive or far more <coughs> overrepresented in people suffering from AIDS, which just forces you to the point of wondering, which is the hardest question anyone in the social movement history is ever going to ask themselves, is this movement that failed? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> and with this, it, it is really hard to say because with this chapter and with the whole dissertation, I mean, you're arguing against a counterfactual, right? Like, if they hadn't existed, would it be even worse? And we don't know. And in terms of what GMAT is doing, they, they also, you know, can't argue against a counterfactual. They can't say, well, we, you know, the rates would be would be X amount higher if we didn't do this. What they can measure is, you know, we had a symposium and a hundred men showed up. We sent a copy of this video to I, I don't know off the top of my head how many um, organizations around the country they sent it to. It was a pretty high number, <coughs> um, so it is fairly widely distributed, but. There's a big gap between this is how many men attended our seminar and this is how many didn't get HIV because of it. And there's like almost no way that there's no way that I know of to like bridge that gap. Um, so yeah, I mean that is that is an important question um, in that one that I um, necessarily that I don't have an answer to. Um, but to your question about the structure of black gay communities. Um, talking about this organization in particular, something that hasn't come out yet in the chapter very strongly, and it, it needs to and will, is that kind of their blind spot is class. Like, they are very much middle class. A lot of them are professionals. Um, they get some kind of heat from their membership, the board does, because they're all professionals and, you know, kind of classes is one of their blind spots. Um, and I think that comes through a little bit in the way the video is, is set up. Kind of there's some class markers um, in it. But in terms of community, I mean, even using the term community excludes some same-sex desiring black people who don't organize themselves in a community around sexuality. And that's something that not necessarily GMAT, but other black AIDS activists are saying is we can't target black gay men because they're in somewhere like Philadelphia, there is no, in Philadelphia they have, there's a neighborhood called the neighborhood, but it's mostly white. There's no black neighborhood. You can't go to the black neighborhood because it doesn't exist. They're saying we need to canvas the entire African American community in order to reach black gay men or black IV drug users because they don't exist in a discrete community unto themselves. Um, nevertheless, there are organizations like GMAD that do come around a self-identified um, gayness or homosexuality. Um, so there is a lot of variation, and I don't even get into rural stuff because that's uh, complicated. <laughs> um, but that, that is, um, Kind of the front line of the epidemic now is doing work in the rural south especially um but it's not somewhere that i get to um in the dissertation mm -hmm. um and then oh, I forget the first question i was working backwards <laughs> i guess the, the fundamental question 
maybe the biggest question of them all, is really a kind of a question of your take on the organization. So wonderfully, you do a wonderful job kind of giving us a neutral reading. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if there's a room there for a more critical one, mm -hmm. or, or the necessity, is a better way of putting it, mm -hmm. for a more critical one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no. When you say that it's, a con it's on a consciousness raising model, yeah. absolutely right. And that's something else that needs to come through more strongly is that they're reading like Audre Lorde and Terry Moraga, and they're really strongly influenced by um, like third world feminists yeah. and women of color, um, really like that. lesbian feminism. Yeah. Really, th that's something that's informing them very strongly. Um, whether that means that it's something different from a social or political critique, I think that's uh, that's yeah. where I mean that's where you draw the line of yeah. political and social. Well, I wouldn't. I, w I didn't mean to frame it that way. I was thinking more in terms that it's not a critique in a direct way of social structure. Mm -hmm. It's an attempt to make the, its target audience. It's aimed at the target audience rather than the structure. Mm -hmm. and so it's not a political movement that's looking to transform the structures in which gay black men live. It's an attempt to transform gay black men's behavior mm -hmm. or sense of themselves. And I guess that's the distinction I'm drawing. It's, now you can argue, well, it's a false distinction, mm -hmm. but it is going around the long way if your goal is to attack those structures. No, yeah, that's, that's, I would agree. I gotta just. <laughs> I, I read this paper and I knew it was supposed to be in Philadelphia, and, mm -hmm. I, and I didn't quite. I didn't this is not Philadelphia. This is New York. This is this is real New York. Yeah. It's not, it's not supposed to be Philadelphia. Um, I mean, Joe Bean lives in Philadelphia. Uh -huh. Um, and I kind of there there's a part of okay. in Philadelphia. Then I'll pass on that. Okay. Because because um. I, I read it, and I was thinking that this is supposed to be situated. Your 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 framework has been Philadelphia. And I assumed that. You know, well, maybe I read it. Um, I, I just wondered about the place, I guess, mm -hmm. the question. You know, but that, that uh, is more, in, in, in a sense, I was more complicated than Philadelphia, so that makes life a, a little more difficult to press my case, but there's a little less, a little less sort of ethnography <coughs> place that gets at Kevin's problem of class. Mm -hmm. That I was having a hard time situating this in the black community, or you know, mm -hmm. where, how does this, and, and, and Kevin's point is that perhaps they actually missed the mark and they, they are in a sense of failure um, because they were class bound and stratified and not reaching the mm -hmm. uh, and Now this is an easier argument to make in, in, in a Philadelphia context than yeah. it is in a New York context because uh, I was thinking about the world of move and, and um, uh, a, a, radically, a radically different, um, uh, it, it, you know, a, a, a place where where the the various racial contests and class animosities are really worn on the sleeve in a sort of a series of villages, and I'm trying to situate this in that, and having a hard time with that. But it's a different. You're situating this fundamentally in North Philadelphia. I mean, it's kind of an awkward tension in the chapter that I do talk a lot about this organization that's New York bound. It's like even more than New York bound. It's Manhattan. Bound. Like there are a Manhattan organization, there is a separate organization in Brooklyn, there is a separate organization in Queens, there's a separate one in the Bronx, like they're very Manhattan and I mean they do some, they're kind of active in like Harlem and then downtown and like they have meetings in, in Greenwich Village, which I mean that is a kind of, there's a I guess complicated ethnography of place there because for some of their membership, that I mean it's something that gets read as white and um, not explicitly exclusionary, but it's a space in which not all their membership feels comfortable. That's an argument that they can use to get money for their own space. Um, so there's that, but then I'm also kind of trying to establish that there is a larger social, cultural, and intellectual world that they're a part of that includes Marlon Riggs, who's in the Bay Area, Joe Bean, who's in Philadelphia, and is even bigger than that. Um, and part of that's just because I want to talk about <laughs> those people. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to make all this happen at the same time. Um, and maybe the, maybe it can't, I don't know. But um, but yeah, so it is, it's, it is 
Very local and well, then not at all. There, okay. there, therein lies a certain, I mean, it, it, it's a certain problem in the way it's written because the place is missing. Yeah. The place is missing and, and the context is missing. And these people do live in a place. Right. And, um, and that place it may set up some serious problems for how, how what the long term story is. Mm -hmm. Um, this is actually has nothing to do with chapter. Uh, so I have to that I haven't read it, but uh, I read a study about AIDS and, and African Americans. Uh, I can't remember the author, but it's called Boundaries of Blackness. Kathy Cohen. Kathy Cohen, that's yeah. right. And so I'm thinking about you mentioned chapter four. I think it was about the church, right? Mm -hmm. And so she talks about how how AIDS is, uh, you know, particularly in the 1980s, is this incredibly stigmatizing you know, disease, right? Mm -hmm. And so to what extent does the black church see AIDS as something that needs to be addressed? Or is it willing to own up that this is disproportionately black? Because Cohen's saying that African Americans are saying we want no part, you know, as a, as a, in terms of race, <coughs> that we don't want to own up to this, mm -hmm. right? So, what does that mean for black gay men? Um, for black gay men or the church or black gay well, men? Well, the, well, the church or the black church and the black gay men. I mean, is, are there are, is there collaboration? I mean, do they find common ground or no? I mean, or do you disagree with Cohen? Uh, I mean, I don't disagree with Cohen. Cohen, so that book came out in 99. Um, a lot of her field work, I think, was done in the 80s and early 90s. So it is a story that, in her analysis, is great. Like, we read a chapter of hers in the Globe today um, because I think that her framework for talking about marginalization is really solid. Um, but since she kind of collected her data, a lot has changed. Some things have not changed, but some things have changed. And the church has made a greater effort to address HIV and AIDS. In a sense, they had to, because people were dying. It is really that basic, is that um, people were dying, and in a place like, like a black church, um, kind of, I don't know whether it's a stereotype or common wisdom or whatever, but it's like, the choir director is gay. Like, you know, like, the black gay men, or black men who have sex with men, have fill very important roles in these churches, and when they die, it's obvious. So, they have to do something. Um, in, in that chapter, I, I talk about, or I will talk about, um, a, a group called uh, the Bomb and Gilead that is an organization that comes out of Harlem in 1989 is when they kind of get going. Um, basically to help black churches do AIDS, um, pastoral care around AIDS, or do AIDS ministry. Um, and some of it is just look like the churches don't know what to do, and it, and it is a complicated issue, and um, you know, different institutions handle it in different ways, and sometimes it's just an issue of having somebody who is not the pastor, who is a representative of an aid service organization, come up in the pulpit and say, you know, this is what you need to do. This is how you protect yourself. There's a bowl of condoms in the back. Take one on your way out. You know, something like that. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not a difficult issue for them to address. Um, but it is something that they do start to address. And necessarily because people are dying, and necessarily because that's a really good way to reach people, is to use existing social organizations like the church, or, I mean, there's a lot of prevention that gets done in beauty salons and barber shops, using existing social networks to reach people in a way that is culturally competent. Yeah. Well, I, <clears throat> I, I think you've uh, done some very nice field work here, and the, the structure within which you're inquiring <clears throat> is going to be a problem for you because it can get very broad. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but just before AIDS hit the media, um, 
there was a big shift in health, uh, public health efforts in general, in the direction of, and it came along with uh, the new economics or Thatcherism or whatever you want to call it. Um, to the effect that uh, if you are unhealthy, in the model, of course, of smoking, it's your fault. So I'm looking at your material and I'm saying, here are these people. You say you're blaming low self-esteem. And my question then is, where did you get that? <laughs> because I think that's a questionable thing. You may want not want to use it. You can finesse that and not get into a psychological argument. But <clears throat> here are these people, and everybody, it isn't just gay people, it's everybody is being told constantly, it's particularly beginning about 1979. If you're overweight, if you smoke, if you don't exercise, and if you get sick, it's your fault. And AIDS was absolutely a part of that picture. There's no, no one quivered about it. It just happened to be a very dramatic part of it. So what I'm trying to get at here is um, the maybe the psychology of these people. How much media do they see? How much they reflect the media? How much are they subject to the normal public health messages that shape the message they were giving? Did they blame people? Um, I mean, to answer the point about self-esteem, I use that language because they use that language. Um, this, is, this is actually the argument that they're making that black gay men are subject to forces that result in psychological distress, low self-esteem. Um, one of, actually a couple of grant applications that they write say that through X, Y, and Z interventions, black gay men will decrease their alienation. And alienation is the word that they use. And I mean, some of these grants get funded. So this is language that at least makes enough sense to the funders for, for them to say, for them to sign off on it. Do you believe um, it? Do what? Do you believe it? Um, do I believe in this model? Yeah. I think they make valid points. So, yes. <laughs> I'm suggesting you Okay. Um, in terms of how, of, of media consumption, a you know, a lot of their argument is predicated on the absence of African Americans in general from media discourse on AIDS, from representations of people with AIDS in the media. The argument is that because, at least in part, of the way that the media has treated AIDS, African Americans think this is a disease of white people and white gay men in particular. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're trying to kind of fight against that. Um, the question of blame is very complicated here, uh, not just or even principally in this chapter, but in the larger project, because when doctors start saying AIDS came from Africa, it's very complicated for African Americans who are very conscious of the history of the biological sciences being used in marginalizing uh, or pathologizing or stigmatizing ways against African Americans, other people of color, are very conscious of this history. And when doctors say this is a disease that came from Africa, which science now corroborates, um, nevertheless, is, is puts them in a complicated position, leads some of them to 
and some of them kind of push back and say, well, you don't know that, like, they're uh, flows of people in the world that, you know, you could easily reverse that. Um, you could easily reverse that and say that, well, white gay men took, took HIV down to Haiti as sex tourists, and doctors say it came the other way, um, took it down to Haiti, and then it went to Africa from Haiti through, um, like, Central African workers working in the Caribbean. Um, I mean, they're basically reversing what doctors are saying is the flow of how AIDS got to, or how HIV got to the United States. They say, well, no, it could easily go the other way. Or, it's biological warfare, it's something created to wipe out undesirable populations, any of these things. These things are all, you know, present in the, in the discourse as a nebulous thing. Um, how about so, the, the anti-smoking campaign? It's a beautiful comparison. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't know much about the smoking cessation um, as a model here, um, so I, this is something I could, I could look into. <laughs> um, Tamara. Um, thanks, and this is really interesting. I don't know if this is out of the scope of what you've been thinking about, but one thing that struck me is if we move away from organizations and back to individuals and move away from contraction and prevention into the process of dying. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if some of the identity politics shift. And if it kind of, just through the act of dying in a hospital, I mean, everyone's dying in similar ways, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering if you've gotten to any sources that discuss that at all, or discuss the way AIDS and um, blackness and class gets conceptualized from a very different vantage point of kind of death and dying or living with illness. Um, and maybe that's irrelevant to the project. It's not, it's like, not at all. Yeah. Um, it's not at all. I'm just trying to think of how to answer that. Um, I, I know that that's, for the, the church organization that I was talking about earlier, um, it started by a woman who was an immunologist at Harlem Hospital. <laughs> and the story that she tells about why she started the organization is that there were all these people dying in Harlem Hospital, and there was nobody there to see them because they had been abandoned by their families or their communities, or, I mean, you know, people were also afraid of, of yeah, of, of people who were dying because they were afraid that they might contract HIV, which is not possible. Um, but, So, yes, <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's... Well, thinking they're dying in racial life, I mean, it's something like Harlem Hospital is... Yeah, I mean, there's a similar phenomenon, I guess, with white gay men who are also sometimes abandoned by their families, um, but... It just strikes me that the end would be more similar than different. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm yeah. wondering if that challenges the um, mm -hmm. rhetoric for individuals. Yeah. yeah. I would wonder. I'm mean, going to share this based on absolutely nothing whatsoever. I'm going mean, to guess the opposite. Really? It's a great way to <laughs> I love arguing. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I mean, yeah. Well, I think, and again, you know, I don't know why the heck you should listen to me about this, but well, I think for the reasons that Dan was laying out, that if there is a sense, if there's a stronger, and maybe this isn't true, so mm -hmm. it should be kind of awkward, critical question. If there's a stronger sense of homophobia that runs through African American communities, then you're much more likely as a gay man dying to die alone. And that's some, that is absolutely fundamental. I think. I would, I would put, this, put that in here. It's really powerful. <laughs> Don't put it in there. <laughs> if it's not true, I mean, if it is true, it just seems like a really powerful and important um, Part of your story. I mean, but the thing is, probably any iteration that you could think of of this dying story of like dying alone or dying in the care of friends or dying in the care of family, you know, you can find that. Like, it's all there. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that just kind of makes it complicated. But for both white and black gay men, I mean, they're, um, you know, structures of non biological family or biological and non biological family. Um, that are called upon to do end-of-life care. 
Um, so that's there for both. And yeah. so can I ask, yeah. just, just picking that project that's sitting up there. So is that assumption that I just made up mm -hmm. uh, at all true that there's a higher <laughs> level of homophobia that runs through African American communities in this period mm -hmm. than in white communities? Or is that just working on some sort of cliche? Um, it's a question that is good. Um, well, you sort of said the other two minutes ago, I was saying it was, the, the, there was something about, the, about, the, about how there were more, uh, as such, the cause of the black gay uh -huh. I mean, no, I think I said that. <laughs> it's, I mean, part of it is. If you take, if, if homophobic, yeah, yes, um, but it's, <laughs> there's, there are kind of different uh, structures of, or different, yeah, different manifestations of same-sex desire and acceptance in black communities versus white communities. And I mean, for, you know, the kind of, I don't know, Norman model of like, I am an out gay man and this is my identity and how much you validate that is a measure of your acceptance of me as such. If that's the model, or if that's, you know, the, the norm, then yes, black communities, you could probably say, are more homophobic. But there are also same-sex, same-sexually active, same-sex desiring, same-sexual loving, people in black communities who don't have being gay as their primary, you know, primary point of identification. And that's secondary or even tertiary to other identities. And in that mode, they may be accepted by their communities. It's like an open secret. Yeah, right. Um, so I mean, by that index, is that better? Is that worse? Is that just different? And I think it's hard to say. Um, I mean, some people make the point, and I think it's a good point, that to say black communities are more homophobic, more sexist, more, you know, any line of any kind of, any number of phobias or isms, um, is to take a behavior or an attitude that is pretty pervasive in American society and pin it to an already kind of stigmatized or, you know, marginal part of the population. I think that's a good point. It's, I don't like to make a lot of commitments. <laughs> <laughs> or judgment. <laughs> yeah, Danielle. Um, I have one comments. Okay. Um, I'm really glad you said that last week, because I was glad you like, I would really caution you to, to make the argument. Um, especially if you're going off of the fact that if you're going to say that black men are more likely to be closeted, that can be due to a number of factors that have nothing to do with homophobia in their communities at large. Um, you know, if you're already in a stigmatized population, it's much more difficult to add to that, right? If you're a white man, it's much easier, I mean, and this is true today as it, is, as it was then, it's much easier to come out. You're likely to already have a built-in community. Um, there are, you don't have any other stereotypes or stigmatization attached to your body. And so I think that that's, you know, it's a touchy, it's a questionable argument to make unless you have some sort of magic miracle evidence that no one else has had. So I'm really glad that you said that lastly, that you're wary of making that argument. Um, so I was going to say I was caution you. Um, and I'd also like to go back to the, to the question that was raised about the general attitude about health care. And I think that uh, I actually don't think you can make the comparison between um, smoking, for example, and AIDS. Uh, because the social meaning attached to these two health care problems is very, very different. And also, the, the gay community and the black community have a contentious relationship uh, to health professionals, right? I mean, the APA is still categorizing homosexuality as a mental illness. Not at this period, point. Right? No, no that is 73. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was it a talk last week? I swear to say it was in the 80s. Okay. I don't think so. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay, but there are definitely still a psychologist yeah. who yeah. could care less that they've said that. Right. I still treat it as a mental illness. Yeah. Um, 
you know, lack of access to health care. And so, I mean, I just think that that's two very different things we're talking about here. Um, the epidemic of smokers and the AIDS epidemic. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. And then I'll just go all the way back to this question about the nature of social movements and, and sort of the goal of social activists. And um, if they're taking sort of third world with feminists uh, to be their guide, so it is very much about consciousness raising, um, that is a reaction to sort of the fear, I think, of surveillance of the communities of people of color, the fear of control of black bodies, of Chicana bodies, etc. And so what is the fear in these communities of, right, if they're going to raise a ruckus, that's inviting a window into their lives that they might not want. Uh, so I wonder if any of that is inhibiting, perhaps, a more open challenge to the structures that are you know, that they're living in. When you say that third world feminism is, that consciousness raising is trying to preclude surveillance? No, I, think, not, a lot, I, thought, I think a lot of the emphasis on, you know, the personal is political, uh -huh. etc. Um, comes out of a need to raise consciousness as a group and to have group solidarity because that's what's transformative for their lives rather than trying to seek some sort of governmental solution because that's just inviting further surveillance onto them and, and further potential further control over their bodies. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, think that's one thing that is uh, maybe unspoken in mm -hmm. these consciousness raising. They do see government funding though, like at a lot of different levels, like city, state, federal from the CDC. Um, so in that sense, I mean, they are actually actually inviting surveillance because when you have a major grant, you have to report on it. Um, so I don't think that that's necessarily the thing that's at the forefront of their minds. Um, I do think that they are working within kind of the realm of possibility for, you know, healthcare in the 19... 80s, early 1990s, which is not the progressive moment. Um, and when they start, they're working before a lot of the AIDS funding comes online with Ryan White. Um, so they know, I think, that they're working in a kind of economy of scarcity. Um, and in the Reagan and Bush years, and so, you know, maybe I think that probably um, informs that kind of approach. Does that make sense? But isn't it also informed by that analysis that you lay out, that there's behaviors that they feel are dangerous, mm -hmm. that are caused by these larger systems of oppression, mm -hmm. right? So they're saying, well, we're going to aim, you can have a two-sided equation, and, you're, and this program aims at the behavioral side. People are doing things they shouldn't be doing under the circumstances, and therefore we need to change those behaviors. So, I mean, it seems like a very straightforward kind of connection between their approach and their analysis of the problem. Which I guess, in one way, kind of brings me back to John's question on the risky sex and drug use. Mm -hmm. So was there a higher level of risky sex and drug use among gay black men and gay white men? Yes. Okay. Um, the drug use, I don't know. I forget how much higher. Um, but, it's there. but yeah, I mean, and there's a survey, and I don't actually remember if I put it in there or not, maybe it didn't. Um, a survey that a group in San Francisco does, I mean, it's not, it's a, a survey with problems, but it still shows that black gay men, or black men who have sex with men, by and large, most of them know, this is how HIV is transmitted, this is what you do to stop it from being transmitted, and they don't do it. This and white gay men do. This is like around 90. So this is at a point when a, when a lot of white gay men have adopted condom use, um, you know, limiting, the number, limiting their number of casual partners, um, they, you know, basically done what public, what the public health establishment told them to do, and it seemed to be effective. Black gay men absorbed all that knowledge, but did not implement it. 
And so they're trying to figure out, like, why? And then what do we do with that? And so well, the answer of what do you do with that is make safer sex normal and make it erotic. Um, yeah. Oh. Um, so could that be an effect of, uh, or a consequence of this sort of uh, consciousness raising, but then sort of having the effect of uh, creating a counterculture? So sort of normal AIDS activism and awareness, but then sort of making a pocket that sort of I, I mean, I don't know if it rewards this sort of risky behavior, but then creating basically a counterculture that, like you're saying, is aware of all these things, but then saying, like, great, that's what we're not going to do. Mm -hmm. Like, that sounds fun. I mean, <laughs> you know? I haven't seen any evidence that it's, like, conscious in right. that way. There are, there are gay men of all colors who resist that kind of public health surveillance for exactly the reasons that, that Danielle pointed out. Because you mentioned in the paper, too, that, uh, or in the chapter, the that these communities went through sort of constructing a usable past um, and sort of making their own history kind of relevant. So I just wonder if this kind of resulted in maybe, I don't want to say creating a monster, but kind of, you know what I mean? Sort of making its own counterculture that then had its own barriers because it was now sort of aware of its own sort of marginalization and kind of having this sort of feedback loop. I don't, I don't think that the causation <laughs> runs that way yeah. because they're doing that in response to the problem that already okay. exists. Yeah. Um, but, and now I forgot what I was going to say. Well, we were talking about earlier this whole problem Using that as part of your authority idea. and animation. Yes. And, and right. yeah. um, you, as a marginalized person, you're told by an authority figure to do X, and you don't accept the rationalization, and you may not accept the entire, you may see yourself as so marginalized that I mean, to, plan, to plan for the future, you have to assume a future. Mm -hmm. To engage in safe sex, you have to plan for a future, and if there's no future, what the hell? Right. Um, and um, so you have to ask whether, whether I mean, I, I keep wondering about the pervasive problem in America today is that there's, there are various pockets of people who are so alienated that they have withdrawn consent and they act in ways that are almost suicidal. Mm -hmm. uh, and this may be one of the cases. I think this is, this is one of the cases. Um, and, I mean, however convoluted it may seem to be like, that's the problem, construct a usable past, um, you know, that is, that, that, that's their thinking. Um, I mean, I think that is, that is a, 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 maybe a good example of kind of their class blindness or blindness to the severity of the poverty in which some people live in. This may be a result of so then you think it was bad. Then they had a bad strategy. Then their strategy was <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I think their, their strategy that. was certainly flawed. Their strategy, I think, was good for people like them. Yeah. But I think that just like they criticize other organizations for not being culturally competent, there are plenty of ways in which they themselves are not culturally competent. And it's when you look at, when you bring class into it, is when they look much less so, so just as a follow-up, is, yeah. is there more um, coherence along class lines than there is along race lines then? In America? <laughs> well, around AIDS, I mean, is, is, would it be a similar issue around reaching for white gay men as it is reaching for black gay men? Like is race, is class actually more important in the kind of strategies you would develop than race? If the racial, if the organization geared to race is missing the major issue, of, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, is, is maybe the, the entire that whole entire strategy is misguided. Um, I mean, just talking in the framework of of the project. Yeah. Um, when you get to the late '90s with the whole okay, ACT UP, that is actually a good example of kind of building a coalition around class issues not so much around race issues, they're racialized because it's Philadelphia and class and race. Um, yeah. I'll just say class and race. Well, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, there are, they're, they're recruiting people from halfway houses, drug recovery programs, because of the sample, it's, you know, people of color end up being very well represented, but there are also recovering white IV drug users who are, you know, impoverished. Um, so I mean that is an example of of, of class being more effective as a 
Yeah, of being effective. Yeah. Um, I, for, yeah, sure, more effective. I know it's hard to say. <laughs> I, I, I don't even want to say what I just said. But I mean, it's hard to I mean, figure out which strategy like, is going to reach. Time. No, just it's hard to figure out which strategy is going to reach yeah, yeah. people the right way. For yeah. All these different. Um, but class, class is definitely salient yeah. in, in some of those. Um, yeah, sorry, call, sorry, call, can, call, and call sure. and in for a while. So I, I'm not, I'm not convinced that you need counterculture or lack of information or anything to vastly, to really inhibit use of something in the context of intimate acts that require trust or imply trust or mistrust. So a few years ago, there was a rural Malawi ideational change project, which involved, basically it was trying to address among set of questions, why do rural Malawians in the face of staggeringly high rates of HIV not use condoms? Come on, we've just airlifted, you know, we've just airdropped tons of condoms on people. Why aren't they all HIV free? So they use, they, they use condoms in <laughs> in-depth interviews and time diary methods, and, and in these interviews it comes out very much like said with the 1990 study. I know I could die. Yeah, I know how it's transmitted. No, no I get it. And so you know, I tend to be kind of a base materialist, and I think that you know a lot of this culture stuff is just kind of happy phenomenal to some set of to some material substrate. But one of the things that came out, so one of the things is was about trust. That if I start, if I suggest we use condoms, what are you saying? You don't trust me, or is there some reason I shouldn't trust you? And so there's that, and it may be that condom adoption only works through cohort succession, right? That you have to have new people coming in and coming in with the idea that it's, you know, for my first time, I'm going to start with a condom. Because um, otherwise, there's sort of a, you have to be within a relationship looking back at what is what came before, why would you need this? But the other thing came out was some concept of sweetness that's very pervasive and that um, condoms were getting in the way of sweetness which is almost sort of this pan-sensuous term. So that language really mattered. Now it's very easy to be a bunch of white scholars and see, yes, he's sweetness. That was clearly this pervasive concept. That's what's driving this. So I, I wonder if there's some other kind of re reducing objectification we can make about other cultural forces that tied in to inhibition for condom adoption. But I, mean, I think trust is a big thing. And we talked about you know intrinsically greater homophobia or something, but you know this is coming on the tail end of Vietnam, decline of the black working class, um, and churches were some of the only institutions where black people owned it. Not a lot of property ownership, not a lot of capacity to do institution building. Churches were places black people own, and and still are some of the only places where black a bunch of black people own some property and can build institutions. So a lot of institution building had to happen within the context of the church because that's where the physical resources were to build institutions. So it may be that part of the difficulty of coming out is not only that you don't have a, you don't have the ability to ex nihilo build a gay institution, you know, gay qua gay, black gay qua black gay institution, but also that other, there, there wasn't a diversity of institutions that you owned where you could have some kind of spontaneous clustering because you just didn't own it. You, the places aren't yours. You can't just go out into the public square and say, this is where we assemble. And, and no internet. And no internet? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the internet is coming online, but that's a different story, I guess. Or, or not, but, um, yeah, I mean, and the black church has a really significant historical role. I mean, in the civil rights movement, all you know, going back before emancipation, has a really important historical function in precisely the way that you said, as kind of as the central institution for um, for black communities. But yeah. Can I ask an actual question? Yes. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, in the 70s, um, combination of black self-help, black Panthers, and, and the sort of rejection of Bayard Rustin, who's 
then becoming you know, he's from uh, from project politics, and there's the you know, pictures of Black Panthers holding up signs, you know, Rust equals fag, and sort of rejecting him on the basis of his gayness. And I wonder what if there is there there's threat and there's opportunity if you're talking the social movements framework, um, and was was integrating black gayness into black, any black liberation, especially post 1960s and with sort of rational cynicism that came out of that, was it more or less a threat to have people who were black and gay among black people for black people who saw, an, saw opportunity for mobility or you know effective citizenship um, was there a was it a, was it more precarious than for any whites for whom nothing effectively the things that are at stake are much more symbolic and not direct threats to you material mobility for uh, well when in sixty three when Rustin organized the march on Washington um, he's shunted off to the side in the movement because of a moral charge, I think because of a moral charge that he had from LA in like the 40s. I mean, the, context, the important contextual information here is that that's not specific to the civil rights movement. At the same time, the State Department was dismissing a lot of gay men and lesbians because they were seen as security threats because they were gay. Um, by the time that you get to the 1970s, post even though you know, complicated that Stonewall is like a major turning point, but post Stonewall. Um, post Stonewall, like post gay liberation, um, the terrain has changed somewhat because you, you can't be fired from the State Department anymore, but um, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, I mean, when you get to like black black liberation, black nationalism, the gender politics are really what underlie that homophobia, not so much that it's part of this larger world in which you can be fired from the State Department for being gay. Um, so I, I guess what I would say kind of synthetically there is that um, you know, in, in civil rights, or in that earlier era, it's more situated in this larger context, and then later it becomes more specific to um, the kind of movement politics that are, nevertheless, speaking to the wider world. I mean, it's the way that they're positioning themselves is not strictly inward. Maybe this is a tangential question, but I would love to hear more about the next chapter of the Nation of Islam. Um, okay, so. <laughs> It's, that chapter is really, it's a specific story, but it's a way of getting at some of the kind of conspiracy theories that I mentioned. The Nation of Islam, you might imagine why. Um, but in the late 80s, there is a, a, a doctor in Kenya who does a trial of um, low-dose oral interferon. Um, I turn to the doctor in the room. Um, so it's, please jump in and correct any like gross misinformation um, here, but um, it's a protein that's administered. Um, he like takes low doses of this protein that's antiviral. Sure. Um, to save with authority the rest of us. Yes, time. okay. It's a, it's a protein. Um, <laughs> But he gives a bunch of people with AIDS in Kenya uh, uh, a dose of this drug, they had, or dose of this protein. They had tried it in, in the US in much larger doses and in injections. He gives it to them in low doses orally. Um, and says that it's really effective in reducing their symptoms. And he says that some of them even appear to have sero deconverted. So they were HIV positive, they appear to no longer be HIV positive. This is like 1989. This is huge news. I mean, this is like, we're still working in the world of AZT, where that's like 
the new big thing. AZT is super toxic and horrible, and they don't really prescribe it that much anymore because of it. Um, so this should be big news. But the WHO tries to replicate his study. He didn't do a real traditional clinical trial. Um, the WHO tries to replicate it. They can't. So the Western press kind of dismisses it. However, the African American press picks it up. It's like, why are why are we not why are we not talking about this? This is huge. This could be. This looks like it might even be a cure. The Western press isn't talking about it because it came from Africa. The Nation of Islam similarly picks it up. This this African cure. Uh, is not being talked about in the press uh, because for racist reasons. Um, they're trying to suppress this drug. Um, they send an envoy to Kenya. They talk to the doctor. They take some people. People are actually going over and getting treated in Kenya. Um, and should we fix it up? And then. Conspiracies. Um, I had a point about where I was going next. Um, oh, so it's this African cure. Except that the doctor got the idea from a journal article published by a veterinarian in Texas, and the interferon itself is manufactured in Japan using like fairly, I think, sophisticated, uh, you know, not genetic engineering, but I think they, they like, grow huge, grow huge quantities of this protein in, in, like, mutant hamsters or something. Um, it gets really weird. But the Nation of Islam is like, this is an African cure, and they frame it in all these ways of, you know, describing the doctor's process of fashioning a crude powder, and that this is very holistic, and this is totally in keeping with, um, with African healing practices because it's produced by the human body. Because interferon is produced by the human body. Not, you know, in Japan they're growing it in mutant hamsters or whatever, but you know, it's an African cure. Holistic human body. And so these are really the, um, the terms in which they frame this drug as being kind of in opposition to a, you know, more Western rationalist biomedical um, model, and they, but they start putting pressure on the NIH to run a clinical trial of it. Um, and after, with some pressure um, from the Nation of Islam, they go around on like a grassroots speaking tour from the National Medical Association, which is a black doctor's professional organization. They agree to a clinical trial and say, this is political, <laughs> like they say, it's political, but it's good political. It's a good, like, good political. It's political, but it's good political. Um, basically as a show of good faith um, that, you know, we'll do this clinical trial. Um, the clinical trial never really gets off the ground, and then by the time that they finally call it, like five years later, I think the trial starts in 92 or 93, and they call it in 97, the really good drugs have come online anyway. Um, so it's kind of a moot point, but, I mean, because it's so attached to the Nation of Islam, it becomes very... Um, kind of politically complicated, it makes them a target for, um, like, tax, like, being audited, and, I mean, this is also the same time that, like, Farrakhan and Million Man March, I mean, the Nation of Islam is kind of having this very big political moment, and I think that gets woven into this kind of trial, um, Complicated ways. So, was there ever a point? I guess that this, that wasn't the story I expected to hear. So, was there a what point? What was the story that you? Well, no, I, I didn't <laughs> have another one in mind. I didn't think that was going to be it. That's right. all. I guess what I was expecting was some version of the argument about crack that AIDS and black community is mm -hmm. for a scene. In that. I mean, that that's another piece of the discourse. Okay. I mean, it's there, and I talk about it, and it's related to these things. It's, there are two versions of, there are variations on a theme. The cure is being withheld, or they created the disease to kill us. Okay. And they don't, they're not even mutually exclusive. No. Um, I mean, it tie, and then it ties back to the Nation of Islam's cosmology, which is, 
that the white race was created by an evil mad scientist to destroy black people. Um, and it also, I mean, it fits in with a lot of other things that the nation is almost saying at the same time about sterilization of black women, threats to um, black women's reproductive health all across the developing world. Um, so it pretty much fits into their worldview. Um, but it's something that's saleable to other African Americans because you know their clinics are fairly popular um, in the places that they are, and they're speaking. The speaking tour attracts people. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, they're you know they're tapping into something. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yes, yes, yeah. It, um, I had a bunch of questions that were very discreet that now kind of collapsed into a mess on here. So I'm just going to just ask one question that just came to mind out what you were just discussing in um, his book, uh, in, in Pure Science, Stephen mm -hmm. Epstein. Yeah. Um, Paints this kind of rather optimistic mm -hmm. history of um, of how patient activism developed in particularly New York, um, that um, the gay men um, became heavily uh, active in um, uh, in, in developing knowledge, in learning um, about the disease. So this is the early eighties when really nobody quite knew what was going on. Um, and essentially, it's this kind of positive appropriation of medical knowledge to the point where, where certain gay men were actually more than their doctors about this. They got involved in clinical trials. And it's this sort of, this is a very positive relationship to, to the knowledge about the disease, the knowledge which itself is in flux. Um, this history you're telling here is, a, is an absolutely dichotomously, uh, a dichotomous history of the relationship of knowledge. It's a relationship of alienation, of mistrust, uh, of conspiracy. Um, uh, and this seems to be a, a pretty um, defining feature of the story. And, and is this, a, is the, I mean, again, I've got this, like, is this race or class it's like, sort of lame identity question here? <laughs> um, but it does seem that Epstein's story is very much about, uh, you know, upper middle class white gay men uh, with the resources um, to, to be able to sort of you know, track the disease full time. Um, this doesn't seem to be something that's available to, to the people in the story. To the same extent, so I just wonder if you could sort of comment about this yeah. kind of epistemological politics of the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, the story that we know, I think, is that Stephen Epstein story mm -hmm. of um, you know, people with AIDS becoming very well integrated mm -hmm. into the system of biomedical right. science. Um, that is an approach. It's somewhat different from the approach that the people that I look at mm -hmm. take, who I think. They have a relationship to that establishment that you see play out in kind of several different ways, but they're at the same time, I think, have a broader purview of more, you know, like the social determinants of health, of poverty, of education, of just well, maybe access to healthcare is a little more, but it, as as something that is different from what what would make. Um, but, yes, it's <laughs> been. Um, <laughs> just please talk. <coughs> Speaking of medical care, um, in some ways, that's what this organization builds on. Mm -hmm. Right? They're saying that that knowledge is being built, maybe it's coming from AIDS patients who are better positioned economically, racially, um, and that this organization's claim to authority is its ability to bridge that. Right. We, white gay activists, aren't going to be able to reach a black community. We can because of our race. Mm -hmm. And then we've been kind of stumbling around the question. So it's not separating out race and class, really. It's the right. complexity mm -hmm. of the intersection of race and class. Because then, you know, I started out with saying, but did they follow a path that their race gave them the authority, but their class approach undermined that ability to build on that authority. Well, I know, John, you had your hand up a long time ago. Yes. Yeah, you know, I want to come back to this. Uh, there was something bothering me when I read this paper in the back of my mind. I can now figure out what it is. It's not bad. <laughs> It's a parallel. 
um, what the details that you were given, as far as I can recall, were replicating the early days in San Francisco, where they did have lower class people who were abandoned and um, abandoned patients. And what I then was thinking, you know, I th and it ties in what, with what was just said now, um, to some extent I think you can characterize this as culture lag, classic culture lag, where you've got what happened in San Francisco first, and then everything else sort of follow the same pattern. And then you can bring in these questions of where the so-called racial groups would be different. You've got these, you've got the set narrative and you're saying, here are people who claim to be different and how different did they actually end up? And this brings in then the um, pictures that we've heard of other organizations and so on. Yeah, I mean, they would definitely, I think, be aware. I mean, they're, it's not even like a pattern, like those are models. Because I think it's sure it's a model. I think it's, I mean. Well, I mean, if, you, if they are, you know, starting in the late 80s and saying, okay. And, and trying to approach it, and you know, well, here's Game Men's Health Crisis or the San Francisco AIDS Foundation or uh, the Women Walker Clinic, and they seem to have been successful. I mean, that's there's a, a kind of toolkit already there, and they're not you know totally divorced from these organizations. They're in you know some of them are very much in contact with them. Some of them volunteer with them or already you know work or have worked in these organizations. So I mean, that's a of institutional knowledge that they would already be privy to, and probably explains, you know, where there are similarities, um, why they're there. And it's the differences that you're finding the most. Yes. <laughs> oh, exactly. yeah. Thank you. Jesse. Um, going back to the um, identity, um, did you, I don't know if you address this in a different chapter or somewhere else in your dissertation, but the distinction between men who have sex with men and gay men. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know when the men who have sex with men, like when that term came up, came about, but mm -hmm. I know in the 80s there was, the, in even the 90s, there was the term down low, where men who would have sex with men, they didn't identify as gay, and so they didn't get involved with activism as far as AIDS and that community at all. So as far as identity goes, like, how did that affect the activism? The fact that there is a big portion of black gay men or black men who have sex with men that won't identify or won't, you know, admit to what that what they're doing or what they did. Like these are men who are married, they have kids, they have these families. So how did that affect activism? I mean, it, for the you know, and I use activism. I should have said in the beginning very broadly to include service organizations. So it's yeah. not just mm -hmm. protest, street protest, or you know, some very. Um, simple uh, idea of, of what activism is, um, I possibly brought with it. Um, but I mean, it would mean that you need different interventions, different programs, different campaigns for those different populations, for men who self-identify as gay, and for men who have sex with men but do not self-identify as gay, where if you even use the word gay, you're basically automatically, they're, they're automatically going to cut off from, from whatever the message is. Um, in the kind of identity politics of it, there are some black men who have sex with men who reject the term gay, but not because they see themselves as primarily straight, but in an effort to kind of forge this separate sense of identity, to use terms like same gender loving, um, or just develop a kind of different vocabulary for describing themselves that is not um, not gay, but not gay because that's identified with whiteness, but also not straight. Um, yeah, but it's cultural competency. You need different different interventions for for those for those people based on 
you know, their understanding of themselves. And were those pretty common? Like, we had those different methods of, or those different ways of interacting with people who didn't, or men who didn't identify as gay, that actually had ways of trying to bring them into the community, or? Um, for GMAG particularly, they say that they want to, you know, involve different, and involve men at different kind of stages of their identity development or their coming out process or whatever. Um, how effectively they do that is questionable. Um, I mean, you know, they stick a kind of character like that in in this film that they make, um, but you know, whether or not they reach a lot of men like that is is a uh, is a good question. So I think it's probably. It's one of those things that's easier said than, than done. Um, and it's, you know, something that looks good on a grant application, but it's probably hard to implement in, in actual life. Um, sort of just has to do with the larger sort of historiography that you're situated mm -hmm. in story in, and it seems like you're much more uh, going with civil rights. Mm -hmm. um, in African American history than you are sort of gay rights historiography or sort of LGBTQI um, mm -hmm. historiography. Um, so am I reading that wrong or is that just what you're talking about today or sort of where do you situate yourself in those two frames? And then I'm also just curious at all if you've um, considered disability studies literature, um, which is sort of emerging in terms of talking about um, AIDS. Um, but I was hoping Allie Day would be here. She's in do you know Allie? No, she's in Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies, and her, her project is on, um, she does Women's Studies and Disability Studies, and she works on the AIDS. So, um, I would recommend contacting her. Does she do death? Uh, I don't think she does. Okay. But anyway, I, I just wanted to I've had so many different sides. Because it might get, I mean, I think they sort of try and bridge a lot of the differences between the different mm -hmm. literature. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right in that, or you are right in that I'm more trying to position myself in the black social movement literature than the LGBT social movement um, literature because in most of the other chapters I'm not dealing specifically with black gay men. Um, I'm dealing with organizations that might involve black gay men um, and often necessarily do, but that's not their, like, specific emphasis. Okay. Um, so that's why I'm more, more in, more in the one than in the other, but... So this chapter is the only ex chapter explicitly about African Americans. Or about, about, uh, gay, gay yeah, African Americans. Yeah. Right. Um, yes. Okay. Although they do, they, they are present mm -hmm. elsewhere. This is... Yes. Um, so, I mean, yeah. So that's why I'm more more in the one than in the other. Um, I I have looked at some of the disability studies literature, but I'm not really I'm not very conversant. You know, no, I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> thinking about what Ali does. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, but I mean, I think there's some overlap between like queer theory and disability yeah. theory and. I mean, there are different ways of, of theorizing, um, theorizing bodies that are different, yeah. but it doesn't it doesn't heavily inform or consciously inform what I'm doing here. So I don't have to yeah. There's another historiographical question. Um, I, I wonder also where you situate yourself within the history of historiography of public health. I mean, if you sort of look at the history of, of epidemics. Um, in the West, major epidemics always involve social marginalization. Mm -hmm. um, it's about Jewish communities, the plague, it's about the Irish and the working class uh, with, with cholera. Mm -hmm. um, then you have a history of a, of a, of a new epidemic emerging um, uh, with uh, terrible, terrible effects in the, in the, in the 80s. 
um, and once again, there's marginalisation. But the difference here um, is it's marginalisation in, in an age of uh, you know, very different political consciousness, very different identities. Identities exist which barely existed or didn't exist during these previous waves of epidemic. So I mean, I think it's it, uh, in terms of engaging with literature and in terms of historic, historically contextualising what you're doing, that might be helpful too. Just mm -hmm. think about the history of marginalisation during during the waves of epidemic disease. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, are you asking how I position myself? Sure okay. I'm not sure whether that's um, a question or a statement. It's just, yes, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good suggestion. It's something that's said at the end of a, of a, end of a seminar. Um, <laughs> maybe no, it's, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good, uh, I think all of these you said are true. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, on that note, <laughs> I suspect that it's probably time to, to see if there's one more question, but we'll like you one more question. I think we have. When everyone starts to after it's three time. hours of you in the hot seat, I'm going to give you a break and give you a hand. So. <laughs> Alrighty, okay. Um, just a word of note to the Thank small you. number here. Next week we have Dan Smail talking about neuroscience and, and neuroscience and logic history and neuroscience. Dialectics. 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 This is the culture week. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go back to science. Back to dialectics. <laughs> yeah.